Welcome back everyone, my name is Caleb and welcome to another episode of Caleb's Corner to what might be the last episode because I am sadly graduating next week. Today, we, I will just be talking about movies in general because, you know, I, I kind of just want to like give my opinions on like what I just feel about just movies like in general. And for my guest today, I have brought in PW's very own Mr. Hackett. Mr. Hackett, how are you doing today? I am awesome, 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 awesome. Ah. Th- Mr. Hackett is the film appreciation teacher and the founder of the film appreciation class as well. So can you tell me like how you got the idea to like start the class? Yeah, um, so when PW used to be uh, four blocks a day and then they moved to the fifth block um, and I kind of saw that, you know, I was teaching 10th grade and I was teaching AP literature, there was an opportunity for me to, to do a class that, that would be kind of fun and incorporate writing and film. And so um, I approached the, the kind of powers that be with this idea about doing a project-based uh, class where kids could work with film, and they were all for it. So um, it's been one of, the best, one of the best experiences of my entire career, so it's kind of nice to have. Yeah, it was one of my favorite classes pretty much out of my entire like, high school career so far. Yeah. So thank you for that. No, it's awesome to hear that because one of the intents of the class was as an elective for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders as a bit of a sales pitch is like to, to grad students like you, students who may not have ever really watched film before or really kind of thought about film and, and you know, this idea that the class would kind of inspire them to do more. And I mean, here we are, right? Yeah. Which is kind of <laughs> an amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, it was film appreciation class was definitely like, cause like I was already like in the film, but it definitely kind of like drove my like drive for film. And it's one of the reasons why I'm kind of, I'm gonna major in film for my college years. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Every teacher kind of loves hearing that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so. no problem. All right, are you ready to get into the questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so for the first question, where exactly did your love for film begin? So this is a, a, a kind of like mini story here. Um, I'm one of five, so like there are four older siblings mm-hmm. and they had no sense of like what was appropriate for young kids to watch. <laughs> and um, When I think back about you know my childhood, some of the most impactful experiences I ever had was around film. Uh, My older siblings showed me uh, Psycho, and so Mm -hmm. for a really long period of time, I didn't want to take a shower. Uh, (laughs) They showed me Jaws, right? This is like Memorial Day weekend. It's a great opportunity to watch Jaws, and um, I didn't want to get in the ocean. I didn't want to get in a pool. I was convinced that a shark was going to come through like the spigot when I would take a bath. And, um, you know, those two films, but really the movie that kind of like, like, pushed me not only towards film, but also to English in general, was, was the uh, Sigourney um, Weaver's Aliens, the mm. sequel, um, which comes out in like 86 or 87. Um, that movie, it's weird. I didn't realize it at the time, the impact it had on me. Um, but then once I started making my way through kind of college prep classes for teaching, my dog is named Ripley after the character. <laughs> I, right? I like that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of these like films that like, and the history about her character originally being written for a man and like there's this whole metaphor for the Vietnam War. I mean, it's got one of the most iconic lines of all time. Um, I just absolutely love it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. Um, So for me, my love for film really started with my dad when I was younger because, you know, my so like like my dad, he's a pretty big like movie buff. He likes he likes he's like he's like a good action movie. So really like you know, if like it was a Saturday night, my dad was like, hey, you want to watch a movie? Because like we lived by this um, place called Family Video um, where you could just go in and like rent a movie for like two dollars. So I don't think they have those anymore because of streaming services. But it was really nice. And then right next to it was a Little Caesars where we could just get a five dollar pizza. Um, so, yeah, we just he would just rent a movie that he w- loved, loved from his childhood and he would show me that. And, you know, I don't think I realized like how much I was really like taking it in, like how much I really loved watching these films. Um, and, and like I said before, um, after like taking like the film appreciation class, it kind of like got me like thinking more about film and like just like there's like there's th- like there's like so much more to it than just like, you know, you just write a story and then just record like there's just so many like different elements that like go into the thought process like every shot like has a reason mm-hmm. um and you know yeah that's that's really kind of where it all started for me it was really no, i mean that's an amazing point so my my older sister is a very kind of uh, reserved person 
Um, and she was the one that showed me Aliens. Looked way too young for that movie, <laughs> right? And I mean, I remember being horrified by it. But that same experience, we went to West Coast Video. It was a hot summer night. We got the VHS. We grabbed the pizza. Uh, I watched it. And, and I was terrified of it. But the driving story there is about like how far um, a mom will go to protect her kid. Yeah. And, and so what I wound up happening that summer, it was like early summer, I wound up renting that movie over and over again. And so not only did I have this like connection to the film, but in my memory, like it's me and her sitting on this like sofa covered in vinyl, right? Like that old school, <laughs> like, you know, sofa stuff, eating pizza and like just kind of like wondering about the movie. So, you know, I think you hit on kind of a nice point about like that kind of commonality that people can have yeah. sharing this experience. Whereas like, you know, when you're reading, you don't really get that. Yeah, right? it's like, cause it's like my dad, like he really like shook, I, th I think it was really Star Wars. That's like that was like the first like big franchise that like I got like hooked on when I was younger because like I had I had no idea what Star Wars was. Um, and then it was like the day when my dad pulled out Lego Star Wars and asked if I wanted to play, and I said I don't know what Star Wars is. Mm. That's when he got. He, that's when he was like, man, I need to sh I need to show you these movies. Like, cause like I remember watching Phantom Menace on VHS because that's all we that we had it on, um, and I I loved it so. And yeah, that's awesome. And he showed, and then he was like telling me like more film franchises, like 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 um the Indiana Jones series, um all like all the old Batman movies. Right, and it's great to have that like cornerstone because so much of our popular culture is like connected to you know especially now that Disney owns the property rights, yeah. right? For because they're just kind of pumping and pumping. Uh, for my own kids, so as a point of reference for your listeners, I have boy girl twins. They're 16 years old, and I have a 12 year old. And during you know COVID, like many people, we were watching right a lot of movies yeah. and TV. So I took that time, kind of like you, your dad did, to kind of you know show some films that I thought the kids may like. And not everything succeeded. I interestingly enough, the movie that like hit them uh, for my older twins was Parasite. Um, I have not seen Parasite and yet. Yeah, my twins watched that, and it's subtitled. And so I wasn't exactly sure how that would work for them. And um, holy heck, did they like? react in a really interesting way to it. And then even before that was Jojo Rabbit. All three of my kids watched Jojo Rabbit. And if you probably asked them what their favorite movie is, I wouldn't be shocked if they said Jojo Rabbit. Like, yeah, I watched Jojo Rabbit. Like, that was one of like the, that was like one of the last movies that I watched in theaters. Hmm. Cause I don't think I, mm, I, don't, I don't think I watched them. Cause like it came out around like December, I believe. Cause I remember I went on a, on a date with a girl to watch it with. Yeah. So yeah, that was one of the last movies I watched in theaters. And like, I hadn't, I knew nothing about it. We were just trying to find a movie to watch. Right. But yeah. Um, all right. So what is it really about film that like fascinates you? Um, so for me, um, I look at, and I'll actually talk a little bit about the film appreciation class. I look at film as kind of like a gateway to storytelling for everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, you take a book. Books can be really inaccessible um, for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. It might be too long. The, the difficulty might be too hard. People may not have time or, you know, they might start something and then get busy. And so the time can be kind of indefinite. Whereas like a movie or a really good television series, right, is like a defined time. And so for the most part, if you can't, peel away, say, time for a 400-page book. Mm -hmm. Most of us can at least get two hours, right? You know, maybe three, depending on what director you're watching. And so, like, you get this, this narrative that when it's done right, it's immersive, right? Yeah. You get visual, you get sounds, like, you, like the, the idea that, that you can have as just happened. Um, in, in all of my classes, I do a film as War Memorial Unit right before Memorial Day. Yeah. I showed my AP Lit kids Saving Private Ryan, and then my film kids watched 1917. Um, kids were crying in Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. Like, I mean, genuinely crying. It, it really does hit hard. Like, just, just like, the, I won't spoil the ending right now, but like, that, that ending really does like hit me hard. Because I, I, I watched that with my parents, and you know, I don't like to show like emotions like to my parents, but like, I was getting a little emotional, I'm not going to lie, watching that. It's, it's hard not to, right? And especially one of the beautiful things about being a high school teacher, um, in relation to that movie in particular, is that I teach seniors. They're you, right? Yeah. Like you're, you're, you are the age group, that, <laughs> that, right? I mean, you're one of those soldiers who's going into battle and you, know, and you follow along with these characters and 
you look at like what they've given up and what they're trying to do and you know and, and then it's when they start to things happen to them like it's almost impossible to not feel that connection especially because of the sacrifice yeah. and um, you know it's to me in particular like when I look at some of my students when they're watching movies it's kind of awesome to kind of look at a kid who you wouldn't normally think would cry and yet they're crying yeah or for instance in Jaws when I used to teach Jaws all the time uh, we ran out of time this year but like the jumps there's three jump scares in jaws and i have i actually have videos of some <laughs> of the classes where even kids who have seen it multiple times still jump right like you don't get that in a book yeah um it just like just like you said with jaws i i remember the scene when like they're like ex inspecting like the boat i think that has like one of the shark bites and like mm -hmm. the one the one like guy that like drowned and, like comes right in like i i remember i was watching on my phone i remember dropping my phone and it just just smashing on the ground because, like, I, that, I legit got scared of that. Yeah, yeah, and the, the funny story is that Steven Spielberg shot that scene multiple times to try to max, and he used a lot of test audiences to like maximize the jump scare yeah. because, like, they didn't have a shark, a working shark yet, so they had to like make it spooky in other ways without like a working shark because the shark was like a, a disaster story as far right. as. Right, so the shark, like they didn't build a shark to like halfway in the filming? Yeah, this is a bit of film history like greatness that happened wow. by accident. They had a shark and because they were filming a lot on the water, they couldn't get it to work. And so. Especially with like that technology too. Right, right, and so the original intent was to have the shark appear early on. Um, and they just decided to start shooting. And it wound up being one of the greatest achievements ever because you don't see the shark till later, it becomes even scarier. Yeah, then. it's like, cause like, cause like all you see are those like, or those like point, point of view shots throughout mm -hmm. like the first half of the film. Yeah. So it's like, you don't even know like, cause like, you, know, you, cause like, like, you know it's a shark, but like you don't really know like how big or like how dangerous a shark really is. Right, and to talk about like, you know, like the power that film can have, right, that, you t it's hard to go to the beach for yeah. people who have seen it <laughs> and to not think about it, right? And so there's a lot of like, like negative sides to that too because it like introduces this kind of mythos that doesn't necessarily exist. Yeah. You know, there was protests about um, you know, sharks and their treatment and all that I kind of stuff. I heard the author of the book that the movie's based off of became a shark ac activist because he felt mm -hmm. bad that a lot of people were like s just terrified by sharks after he wrote and the movie came out. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's hard to imagine not being terrified, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially at the, the end of that film. Um, I want to add to your point, too, about like, you know, like how like movies can be very different from books because, you know, I think books are like for like a certain like group of people because like, you know, there because there are some people who like they, they, they can't like sit down and just like read for that long because it's, you know, I can I can read for a good like hour but like I don't think I can just like just like just sit and just read a whole entire like 300 page book. But when it like when when it like comes to film, you know, it's like like everyone like they has they they have their like own like type of like film that they like to watch. Um, some people like action movies, some people like dramas more. And then you have like the mix between both too. So I think that's why film also fascinates me because like it can like appeal to like pretty much everyone, and you know. It, it's it's and like you know like you have to like entertain someone for like two two hours or maybe three hours and so I, th I think that's that's amazing that like film can do that to someone. Yeah, I, I agree. And what I think is fascinating too is is I'm old enough now where we're kind of starting to see this like really awesome shift and a lot of like attention being paid to um, television uh, like miniseries like yeah. a show like Breaking Bad, which you couldn't I mean you could do it as a movie, right? But to, to take that concept and to kind of piece it off hour by hour is very book-like. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't require that like active nature of, that you would get with reading. And yeah. so, and the beautiful part about say like a Netflix, right? Stranger Things this yeah. weekend is that if you want to jump right in and shoo, go straight through, you can, um, or you can kind of slowly do it, which is what my family is doing, which is driving my kids nuts right now, <laughs> like forcing them to kind of pace themselves. Like but or like what Disney does for all their shows. Right, right, right. But I'm with you. I'm an English lit major, and I can't sit down and read 300 <laughs> pages. Like, I just can't do it. I mean, like, tension-wise, time-wise, um, there are some books that, like, I dive into, but it's rare that I'm going to, like, pick up something yeah. and, like, just, like, be like, oh, my God, I have to finish this. Um, all right, so for the next question, so screenplay writers, they don't get, like, as good of a rap as, like, 
say the director. So like, do you think that screenplay writers should be getting as much recognition as the director? I love this question. I think this is actually, a, and every screenwriter also <laughs> loves this question, right? Um, I, I do, and with a caveat, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at the Golden Globes and the Oscars, there's like these awards for best, best screenplay or best adapted screenplay. And that's really the only time you ever see screenwriters really get kind of a moment to shine. Yeah. Because oftentimes, like they're pushed, they're not even typically allowed to be right on, on set when they're recording. And you know, oftentimes you'll sell a script and it'll get rewritten multiple times and maybe you get a credit and maybe you don't, right? Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because most people associate film except for like the marquee directors, like your Steven Spielbergs. Most people think about it through the actors and the actresses, yeah. right? And so, you know, it's not necessarily fair, but like, you're like, oh my God, well that Samuel Jackson movie, right? You're not <laughs> thinking about who wrote the lines for Samuel Jackson, you're thinking about the way that they were delivered. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like Wizard of Oz a little bit, right? Like it's like the magic maker behind the curtain, so to speak, and mm -hmm. you don't really get to see always unless somebody kind of pulls it back and you, you know, you get to kind of really look at that screenplay. Yeah, it's like, because like, 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 if unless you're like one of like the great directors, like you know, because like like you said, Steven Spielberg, Tarantino, everyone's going to be looking at the um, actors and actresses, which you know is fine because you know they are they are like they they are what brings life to to the movie. But you know, at the same time, it's the screenplay writers are the ones that like they're like the like they're like the, the start. They're like the foundation. They, they're the reason like why this movie is even going to be getting made in, in general um, and yeah I don't I don't necessarily like that like you know like once they kind of like sell their their like screenplay off they can't do anything about it that what happens after that um, I mean sometimes it's good because um I watched the movies that made us on Netflix I don't know if you've watched any mm -hmm. episodes yeah and Forrest Gump that got that that oh, that script got rewritten which thank God it did because like the, the original script was not it's, it probably not have turned out very well. Right. Um, same thing with Back to the Future. The ending got um, re got rewritten as well because um, originally it was going to be this like huge like utopia, which wouldn't have made any sense because Marty McFly would have done nothing to like to like have that happen. Right. Um, now I have a question for you. So I'm curious. Are you thinking screenwriting? Is that where this question is coming from, or is this just a general I, question? Personally, I kind of like want to do you know like. I kind of want to do like what Tarantino does, where he writes his movies and he directs them as well. I know that's, especially for like a very unknown for a very like unknown directors, that's something that like doesn't happen very often, because like movie studios they want a big name on, on on the project. But if if I do like if I do like you know get this far in like a f my film career, I want to be able to like write and direct because like I I do love writing like writing screenplays. Um, I wrote. A screenplay last year and mass in my mass media two class um, called Gabriel Hearthstone and the Spear of Destiny, which it was pretty much just a parody of Raiders of the Lost Ark, mm -hmm. but it, but that's just because I like that I like that movie, so I took a lot of elements from that movie. Um, and if if I were if that movie was to ever get made, I think I would want to be the director because it's because like, I I wrote it down and it's my vision because um, maybe a director has something different that I don't like. Right, so right, right. Yeah, that's, there's, there's some, there's, it's one, that's an amazing approach too, and there's some hope there um, for you and for your listeners. If you don't already know, I highly encourage looking up the story about Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunting specifically, mm -hmm. uh, because that was a script that they, that they wrote and tried to find, you know, and it kind of got washed away, but then winds up winning Best Picture. And yeah. so um, there are definite examples, and usually, oftentimes, it's sometimes the first time, like, breakthrough writers who do take that path that suddenly become our Quentin Tarantinos or you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's why that's why I think personally that you know Tarantino like most like 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 most of his movies like cuz like when I, whenever a Tarantino movie comes out you know it's going to get good reviews and it's because he's the one that wrote it and it was his vision. So he knew exactly what he wanted to do it. And I think that's why it works cuz you know with some directors um, like for Star Wars the Last Jedi the reason why I think that it kind of fell apart is because of like how many different visions were in it. Because right. you had J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnsons that, and both their vision, those both their visions just collided together, and I think that's why the sequel trilogy kind of turned into a mess by the end, just because you had just colliding in, um, visions. So I think that's why, it's I think that's why I want to like just write it, write and direct my own screenplay. 
I'm with you. I think you should, for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. So do you think that out of all like the media art forms, because you have like music as books or art, um, do you think that film is one of the hardest ones to like get right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And and not because I'm biased towards it. I think it's one um, it's because it's so collaborative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything from the actors to the grips, right, to the lighting, to the cinematographer, to the editors, to to the guy that's like running the electrical wiring, you know, the person, the guy or woman, and and so, um, and the time it takes, right? There's this amazing little anecdote about 1917, which for your, for people who may not know, is a movie that's based in World War One. It's meant to feel like it's one, one single long, long shot, day, right? Yeah. And, and so in one of the featurettes about making it, they talk about having to wait for the clouds because it's being naturally lit. There's no artificial light in that film other than some of the night shots. And mm -hmm. so if you can imagine, right, like <laughs> sitting around on location, literally you're just wasting money, right? You're just literally watching dollars go away, waiting for the cloud cover to be similar to what it was, and then you have to start shooting. Um, and that's, that's true to like, you know, the idea of, of when, going back to your earlier point about vision, when vision matters yeah. and people want it to not be passable or to just make money, but they want it to be a work of art or they want it to say something, um, then without a doubt. That's not to say the other forms like music or, or, or writing a novel or poetry don't have that same level of quality control, but oftentimes, right, it's, you know, if a writer, you might have an editor, yeah, uh, maybe two. If you're a musician, you have sound editing, mixing, and maybe a publicist and that kind of stuff. With film, you're talking about hundreds, if yeah. not thousands, of people. Yeah, because like you know, if you watch like the film, like film credits, you know, nowadays that can be from like three or five minutes because of how many people they took to like make that movie. Right. I have a friend. Um, I, he's like he'll always tell me that he loves watching film credits because he just loves like watching, just like seeing like how many people it took to make just like, you know, a two hour or maybe an hour and a half long, long movie. Right. Um, I think that it's one of the hardest because there's like, like to get right, because there's like a lot of also like, like, like universal rules to film. Cause like with a novel, you can write as long, as much as you want. Um, Cause you know, Harry, the Harry Potter books, like the longest one is like 800 pages. That like, if someone was to take, um, I think it's the Order of the Phoenix, that's the longest. If someone was to take the Order of the Phoenix and make a movie like, and like make the movie exactly like the book, that's like a five hour long movie. And it just wouldn't work with like audiences because no one wants, because no one wants to sit down and just and watch a movie for five hours. Cause like there's, cause like with books, you can like read it and then just like, you know, once you're done reading for the day, you can just put it down and just come back to it later. Um, but like, you know, with, you can't like just pause a movie in like the movie theater. Right. Um, so. Yeah, that's the key, right? Yeah. Because the, you know, Hollywood wants you to, to pay that movie ticket price to go to the physical theater. I mean, that's where the majority of their profits yeah. are gonna come from. And, you know, I remember probably being about your age when JFK um, came out, like the actual movie JFK with Kevin Costner. Um, and that movie had an intermission, which is rare today, because the movie I think probably was somewhere near the 315, yeah. three hours, 15 minute runtime. Um, you don't see intermissions really anymore, yeah, right? The only movies I can really think that would have like that would have an intermission would be like The Godfather or yeah I can't I like at least with movies nowadays I can't really think of one that would be I mean if like Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League had come out in theaters there probably would have been an intermission because that was a four hour long movie right, right. but yeah m like the longest movie I watched in theaters was Endgame and that was that was three hours long right and that would have been you know you think about the logistics of of an intermission with a movie like that, because not only would you give people maybe 10, 15 minutes, so now times how many times you want to show that, you're taking away profits, yeah. because that just means that theater is going to be used for longer. And and really, like, a movie, right, the whole the old Hollywood rule is you want to you want your movie to be just long enough that people don't have to use the bathroom yeah, while they're watching exactly. it, right? I don't know about you, but I can't make three <laughs> hours without having to be able to pause the movie or try to, like in Avengers Endgame, wait for a supposed boring part and run to the bathroom, yeah. and thankfully, right? Um, I'm able to do that a little faster. Yeah, there's only like two movies I can think where like I, I, I like, like just like you said, I was like waiting for like a boring part and I just ran to the bathroom. I 
is Last Jedi and Black Widow. Those are the two movies I can remember going to the bathroom during. That's interesting. Yeah, sometimes I'll purposely not drink something. Like if it's a movie I'm really excited to see, and yeah. it's going to be long because I just I just know that invariably I'm going to have to use the bathroom. Yeah, for the for the Batman, I like made sure that like I like went to the bathroom like at least two times before. That's even funny. even though I didn't even have to have to go the second time, I was like I needed I I did not want to have to go during the movie. Right, and that's a long one too, right? Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, almost three hours long. Right, right. All right. So what do you think is like one of the biggest problems or just multiple problems that can lead to a bad movie? Yeah, it, this is an, like an interesting question, right? So there are so many parts, right? There are so many parts that go into a film that I think I think the first part is is does the director have control of the vision? Yeah, exactly. Right? Or is this is this a money maker for the for the company that's making it? And so that's a big one. Yeah. Um, I'll give World War Z as an example. It's a book I loved. I loved the, the zombie survival guide. I was excited for the film. The film itself was ridiculously expensive. Was so over over budget. It's a lot of CGI zombies, right? Right. Yeah. And they had these super expensive on location uh, set pieces. And the director had this clear vision, the name escapes me at the second, and um, they brought it to some test audiences and they didn't like the ending. So they went to the director and they said, we want you to change it. He said, no. <laughs> and they said, all right, well, we're gonna fire you if you don't change it. And he said, no. And so they fired him, they brought in new writers and they changed the ending. And so it's rare to have someone stand up for themselves that way. Yeah. Um, but I liked it, right? And you can almost pinpoint the exact second where the ending is changed in that film. Another good example is is Jared Leto's Joker, right? Man, I mean, I can't stand that. It's crazy, right? <laughs> and, and so that movie. What's What's interesting about that movie, though, is it was not good. Yeah. It wasn't awful, but it wasn't good. It was a suicide, suicide squad. Suicide squad. The first squad. suicide right. squad. Right. And they they promoted him heavily. He's an Academy Award winning actor, right? And then he was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> they, they edited him basically out of the film, right? Yeah. I mean, he's like so, so small. And yet when you look at that movie, it made a fortune, right? Yeah. And so like it made so, and then another great example of that is somebody was like, all right, well, Jared Leto was bad as the Joker, so let's get him as Morbius, right? <laughs> and that movie has like a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Yeah. It costs something like $75 million to make. It has grossed 145. It's even a bad movie. I, I did not. I didn't. I didn't know. It, I knew it grossed a lot of money. I didn't know it grossed that much money. I can't believe it, right? And so you ask yourself the question: Well, where did it go wrong? Is that a casting decision, right? Like if if Jared Leto wasn't Joker, it was somebody else, or he wasn't Morbius. Was it was it the director? Was mm -hmm. it the pro producers who said like we need this to do X, Y, and Z? Um, I think ultimately. It, it comes down to like directing and casting. Yeah. Right. And and I think the other part that 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 often gets overlooked it, until Academy Award season or Golden Gold is the editors. Right. You can have an amazing editor take a really bad film mm -hmm. and make it passable. Sometimes even great. Um, and so you know the invisible hand of editing can save a lot of a lot of things. It can also make things worse. But. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's if the director and the the casting don't work, you know, there's only so much an editor can do, right? Yeah, um, I like I like what you're saying about the casting because that's definitely a big part that can that can lead to a bad movie. Um, so, a story about uh, going back to Back to the Future is Michael J. Is that his name, Michael J. Fox? Yeah. Now, Michael J. Fox was not who they originally um, picked as a Marty McFly, though. He, he they, they it was a pick that the director wanted. The studio did not want Michael J. Fox, and he was already like on Family Ties, I believe that was the name of the show. Mm -hmm. um, so they got this other actor. I don't remember his name, and but the problem was that Back to the Future they're they're going for more of like a kind of like a sci-fi comedy action movie, um, but he he was not taking it that way. He was kind of taking it as a more like serious movie. Um, and you know they had already filmed like half of the movie, and the director was just like, "No, this movie is not going to work with this guy. We need Michael J. Fox." And they f they like begged the studio, and the studio finally s finally allowed them, and he was able to like fix a scheduling conflict with Family Ties. 
Um, Eric Stoltz. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. we go. Um, and so then they brought in Michael J. Fox. They sh they like they had, they had to shoot so much though after that, like the rebuild. But in the end, the movie was like I think believe it was one of the highest grossing movies in uh, '85. It's in, right, and back to your point about the director having that vision and you know kind of the ability to to say no, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is this is what I what I want, or this is where we need to go. Um, another kind of a great example. Sometimes again, back to how sometimes accidents become miracles. One of my favorite films, and also a really powerful film, is One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Also, the book that made me want to be an English teacher, by the way. So wow. um, they're they're kind of two. Uh, sides of the same coin, but when they, the, the history of that film, the making of it is so spectacular, but in real short time, they could not find someone to play the lead roles, both for Nurse Ratchet and for McMurphy. They went through three actors for Ratchet and ultimately settled on Jack Nicholson, and then they went through multiple actors and ultimately settled on, um, her name escapes me right at the second, they both go on to win the Academy Awards. They <laughs> launch their careers into stardom. Is that Jack Nicholson's breakout role? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, he had done Easy Rider at that point and uh, a couple small things, but he was relatively unknown. Yeah. And, you know, when people, that movie is almost, you can't remake it. Like, it would, you would be almost like a suicide mission yeah. because it's just so iconic. And, uh, you know, in the, but on the flip of it, there's a character called Chief that's supposed to be a really big Native American um, in the film, indigenous person, and they couldn't cast it because they needed somebody who was really, really tall, and yeah. they couldn't find someone to play that role. And then there's a funny story that one of the producers owned a car dealership, and in walked the actor, and he was like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? Yeah. And the guy's like, sure. <laughs> so it worked out well. Um, so like, I'm going to give another example for like a movie that like it was could have been good, but it just went down south. Um, the original Justice League movie. So for those of you who don't know, um, so there was two Justice League cuts. There's the original that came out in theaters, and then the Zack Snyder cut, which originally Zack Snyder was the like, original director, and he, um, like what like came out uh, from the Zack Snyder cut was supposed to be like what was going to be released in theaters, but the studio did not. They just they just did not like what uh, where he was going with it. So just midway, they fired the director, which that right there is like, a, should just like, that it's most likely gonna lead to a bad movie because if you have to fire the director in the middle of filming and get a new one, like, like I said before, then the visions will just clash together and it will just become a mess of a movie. And that's, that, 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 that's exactly what happened. And yeah. I'm with you and I, I actually, it blew me away that the movie, the movie that I'm gonna mention that got so much hype was the Freddie Mercury movie that came out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. That movie is a disaster in so many levels, <laughs> and yet it was nominated for all these different awards to the day that like, I, and never mind the fact that it's not even historically even remotely true, right? It's just almost like fabricated story about, about his life, and, and so, is it Brian Singer, right? I think it was Brian Singer yes. on that, and so it just wound up, but and on the flip, right? It's sometimes people, just respond to things in such a way that like, you know, I, I think that's a key to the industry is if, if something makes money, it sometimes doesn't matter if it's good. Like, I'm gonna throw some shade on Michael Bay, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Michael Bay is that kind of guy where, you know, like he's got this, this directorial style and it makes a lot of money. Yeah. You know, Transformers Dark Side of the Moon might as well be as interesting story-wise as reading like a, an old like, you know, menu. <laughs> but yet it makes money. Like in, and so, you know, I think I think sometimes Hollywood is, is like, you know what, we're gonna give you a nice big long leash because we know you're a cash cow. Yeah. And then sometimes you get directors who they kind of maybe see that like, oh, this is not gonna make us money. Yeah. And so then they, they make their decisions and it's kind of a shame. Yeah, um, I'm gonna give one more story about like, um, this is not a bad film, the story I'm gonna tell, but before I ask the next question, um, a teacher told me this story. So, have you ever seen the movie Seven? I have. Yes, yeah. so um, the ending, uh, I won't say it right now, but the ending is very heart, uh, very heartbreaking and it definitely leaves a huge impact because when I first watched that with my dad, I was just, just blown away by like how impactful that ending was. Um, the ending was supposed to be completely different um, originally, and it's one of the rare occasions when, like, the director he said, "No, we're not. I'm not doing this. 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 This ending." Um, and the studio execs they 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 just gave in, and now 
seven is one of like one of my favorite endings just because of like how impactful it is. Yeah, I, I saw that in the theater. Uh, oh, that must have been fun. Twice. Like, that's, twice. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> because like you know this is way before. It would take a long time for for films to get released. Uh, you know, there was no digital release. Yeah, yet. I, yeah. Even even when it got re when when DVD was out, it would take a while for it to get released on DVD. Right, and so I knew that I had to, and this is kind of like. I was in college and I was an English lit major and film majors didn't really exist on, unless you were in like NYU. Yeah. Um, and so there were no film classes at Pitt. Um, I went w on a date with someone to go see that film, not knowing what we were about to watch. <laughs> Never mind, that was like a buzzkill, right, for the rest of the evening. But um, interestingly enough, it wound up working as a date because she and I both went back to see it again, either the next night or the, the following night, just to process. Mm -hmm. uh, David Fincher is a genius, right? Yeah. I mean, like his camera work alone, um, I mean, that movie is just a masterpiece, even though the subject matter itself is so ridiculously dark. Yeah. Um, and like you, I mean, it's hard to watch that movie and not, similar to Saving Private Ryan, to not have an act reaction at the ending. Yeah, another, Another good David Fincher movie would be Fight Club mm -hmm. that has another like ending that is just blows blows you away. And funny, I watched Fight Club a second time and there's so many things that I was like picking up on like I, like I, like as I, I was watching it cuz like he cause, like they pre pretty much like foreshadows like the um, ending for you like right then and there and I didn't I, did, I didn't understand it. Yeah. Like, and that's a movie that made me going back to our actor's comment that made me actually appreciate Brad Pitt as more than just a pretty face. Mm -hmm. uh, in that film, he like really showed some range um, in relation to what he was capable yeah. of doing. And you know, his career initially started as like kind of a heartthrob, and and now it's just kind of interesting to look at the roles he's played, um, starting with that one, really. Yeah. Um, all right. So to the next question, who would you consider like the top directors of all time? Yeah. So this is this is. Uh, it's a hard question yeah, to answer, right? It's a hard one. You know, because you have a lot of people judging you on your answers, especially if you have people who are kind of film heads. And so uh, I kind of like frame it around the Mount Rushmore. Who would be on my personal Mount yeah, Rushmore? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of Hitchcock. You know, I think Hitchcock did so many things in a time period where both the cameras were limited and also the sensory board kind of limited content yeah. a lot. And the way that he was able to kind of tell adult stories about kind of getting in trouble to this day is still a master stroke. I show Psycho in my film class, it's a black and white film. He filmed it in black and white on purpose and not in color for a reason. And, and you know, students still react to it. Yeah. Like they still, and that movie is so old and the shocks and the plot twists and so, um, there's a lot of things that he kind of broke ground on. I think no matter what list, he's going to yeah. be there. Um, the, the, the person I think for me, as I think about it, really is, is and it's a little cliche, but it's Steven Spielberg. I, I have to agree with you. Yeah. It, when you get someone who is able to, to kind of straddle so many different genres and, and films that just kind of speak beyond their, I mean, Jaws to this day in 2022. It's, it's, yeah, it's 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 still good, and it right. still and it still looks good too. Yeah, Saving Private Ryan is 98, right? Somewhere yeah, I in that believe neighborhood. so. And and so that's considered to be one of the best war films, if not one of the most like to this day. Um, one of the stories that impresses me the most is is Schindler's List and Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Do you know the story about those two? Yes, I believe you told me last year, but you should tell it for my viewers. Yeah, so he made a deal. Um, nobody would really, nobody wanted to make a black and white three hour film about the Holocaust. Yeah. And so he kind of like, I'll shorten the story. He kind of kicks it around, he sells it to a few other people. It comes back to him. And so when he negotiates the contract for Jurassic Park, he basically negotiates Schindler's List as part of the deal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, He's, he's editing, <laughs> uh, I think I might have these backwards, but he's editing Jurassic Park at night and filming Schindler's List during the day, or it might be reversed, <laughs> but to that's, be able- That's still crazy though. It's not only really crazy, it just kind of shows you genius, right? To yeah. be able to have two distinct visions and, and clear, right? And have them competing at the exact same yeah. time for your brain space to me is like, 
and he's still making good films. And even his bad films are still good, yeah. right? <laughs> like, and it's, it's incredible. Um, and another one I just think his time will be fully appreciated a little bit down the road is, is there's two names I'll throw out there. Is, um, Sam Mendes is already getting a lot of, I mean, you know, he's got some pretty iconic films, but the director I'm kind of in love with the most right now is Denis Villeneuve. What movies has um, he done? So he did Arrival, which is on my top 10 list of I've all seen, time. I've seen that. Uh, he just did the new Dune film, um, which you know is, is breathtaking. He did Blade Runner 2049, uh, which didn't get a lot of, like, lot, didn't make a lot of money, but it's still a phenomenal film. I've heard people say that it's one of those like movies where it's possibly better than the original. I, I, I kind of fall into that camp. I think a little bit just because he has access to like you, you watch the old Blade Runner now, it feels a little old, uh, yeah. technology wise. It, the thing with when I so I, I when I watched Blade Runner, it was not my favorite movie. I really watched it mostly because I love Harrison Ford. He's one of my favorite actors of all time, and it just was not really what I expected it to be. Yeah, and I think that's a common kind of occurrence. It's one of those kind of films that when you, when you say to yourself, you know what, I want to be a serious film person, or specifically I want to be a serious sci-fi film person, mm -hmm. you kind of have like the films you have to see. You have to see Space Odyssey, right, 2021 for yeah. Kubrick. Um, you kind of have to see Blade Runner just because of the world building that it does that winds up, for instance, like The Matrix wouldn't really be the Matrix were it not for Blade Runner that comes before yeah. it. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that they made 2049, um, and it was also interesting that it didn't do as well. Uh, Denis Villeneuve has a film on Netflix called Enemy. It's one of his first, like, um, English films in English, and he's a French-Canadian, I believe. Um, highly recommend it. It's a psychological yeah. thriller. It's really awesome. Yeah, I might give it a watch. Yeah. So for me, my my top directors. So like you said, Steven Spielberg is just like when like just when I think of like his like filmography, I remember the first time I like I, I, I like looked at his filmography because like th there were times I didn't realize because I was a little younger. I didn't realize like how many of my favorite movies of all time he had actually done. Mm -hmm. And you know he's also like like you know him you know people like him and like George Lucas you know they really like define like what like the modern like film could be because you know Jurassic Park that's like that was like mind-blowing when people saw when it was like the first like CGI like di I di dinosaur five times five times, five times in times. the theater <laughs> I, it was in high school I took five different dates like to go, <laughs> just because like you know it was just mind-blowing right? yeah yeah um yeah when, like I remember watching it and like it's it still looks good I mean CGI, you know, it's a little dated, but it's sti but other than that, it still looks good. You know, like the animatronic um, T Rex scene, like I always love that. Um, it's funny, uh, funny enough. Um, so like in that scene, because it's like raining and like the T Rex was like made out of foam, like it like like, like the T Rex like like ended up like gaining weight. So it's like, <laughs> in like some shots, like he might be like a little fatter because like the water kept like soaking in. Right. But yeah, and then like you know Jaws that came out in 1975, and they were. They're able to accomplish getting, you know, getting that shark to somewhat work, and it's, it, it, and as you said, it still looks good. It looks better than some of the sequels to Jaws, which is, I don't understand how that's possible, but right, it is. right, yeah. Um, so my other like favorites recently, um, recently Jordan Peele has become one of my favorite yeah. directors. Um, he's he's because like you know he's really like the master in like suspense and thriller. Um, when when I first watched him Get Out, like. I was blown away, um, and just like the shots where he did, where like um, the character, like he like he, he takes the picture and like the flash goes on, and that just that one tear just rolls down his mm. his face, and he's saying "get out." Like that is just terrifying because it's like, it's like it's it's slowly building up to like this this family is nuts and crazy, um, and then two other ones. I love Tarantino. Um, I know he's can be very controversial to some people, but. I think that's what I like about him. He's not afraid to like push boundaries that most other people wouldn't want to push. Um, I think you told me that you watched Pulp Fiction like a m multiple times right. in the theaters. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had yeah. It, it, I'm with you on Tarantino in relation, especially to his ability to like. He's a person that knows what he is and mm -hmm. he knows what he wants. And when you go to sit down and watch a Tarantino film, you can you know this kind of the style 
that is going to be there, and yet he still finds ways to be innovative, yeah. right? And you know, like you know, you're going to get these long conversations, and 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 yet they're still enthralling. And you know, I think that's kind of a nice like compliment to to him is that to be able to work within the wheelhouse he's working and still kind of maintain relevancy um, and throughout. Like, I mean, think about these guys, like these directors. These yeah. had careers that have spanned, <laughs> right? Like, you know, like, 30, you know, yeah, 40 years. I believe right? Reservoir Dogs came out in 92. Right. And so, yeah. He, um, so I have two more directors that are on like my Mount Rushmore, like like you said. That's right. Um, so I would say a Mar a Mar Martin Scorsese. He's he's been he's very recent one because I very much recently have been watching his movies. By the way, rest in peace to Ray Liotta, yeah. who just died a couple of days ago. Right. Um, but I love Goodfellas. I it might be controversial to some like you know film film buffs, but like I I like Goodfellas better than The Godfather. I think mm. it's a better mafia movie. Um, because I I thought and like people I, I I'm not the one who's come up with this point. But I've heard people say it, but I like this point. The Godfather was like showing like what the mafia want, wanted people to think of of, of, of like the mafia family, and then the Goodfellas kind of showed you like what like what the like what they actually were, because like the scene where like the first like the first scene when like they're like adults at that point, and like they're all in, they're all inside that um, restaurant, you know, they're being super loud and just super rude, and it's like that's that's what they were. They were they were just loud and rude all the time, and. I just like watching the journey of a Henry Hill, which <coughs> I was, which I didn't realize it was a true story until like, until I, I watched it that first time. I'm with you. I, I find uh, gangster films in particular, <coughs> excuse me, hard to watch yeah. um, for a lot of reasons, but particularly the romanticism that occurs. So Goodfellas with you, right, is is that point of. Um, they're not good dudes. Yeah, they're they're not someone you want to emulate. They're not. It's not something that you want to like you're not supposed to be like you're not supposed to be like rooting for 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 these guys right and and at the end of that film you you wind up in a place where you without spoiling it anything for your viewers um <clears throat> you don't want to be there yeah. right <laughs> like the ending of the movie to the to the protagonist in particular um there's nothing there for you yeah. right and it's certainly not glorious which i think godfather kind of does the opposite of which yeah. right like at the end you have a lot of people who kind of like see themselves as Michael Corleone or want to emulate Michael Corleone, at least, you know, like, ooh, I'm kind of Michael Corleone yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that. And, you know, just like some of the some of those Scorsese movies, um, I love Shutter Island. I think it's, it's very it's a very well done, like, thriller and suspense movie. Um, I'm blanking on the ones. Raging Bull. I, I love, I, 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 I will admit I like Rocky a little bit better for a boxing film, but I think Raging Bull is like great, like you know, like kind of like mature, um, um, sports um, boxing film. Just because like, just like you know, Scorsese he's very good at like, at, like making us like follow characters that suck. They're not right. Um, I don't remember the main character's name in Raging Bull, um, but I yeah, know I'm played, drawing a blank on that too. Um, It'll come it, to me. It's uh, I just know that he's um, played by Robert De Niro. Right. And right. right. He's not he he he's not a good guy. Like really, like like right at the beginning scene where like you can already tell that like he's he's a he's a pretty he's like he's a, a domestic abuser and he's he's just not a good guy. But like you're following his story and you know it's kind I it was, it was a little like kind of heartbreaking just like just like kind of like seeing like his like downfall as like a as like a famous boxer. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I Rocky to me, and I guess that's kind of the point too of the vision, right? I think we're meant to to cheer for. Rocky mm -hmm. as a character, whereas um, Lamada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It was, was Lamada. Yeah. Um, whereas on that other side, you're not really. You're meant to kind of, I think, understand place, yeah. right? Where this person, a similar film, is um, Slumdog Millionaire, right? Um, you kind of compare those two, whereas one guy kind of goes bad, and you know, in Slumdog Millionaire, you have. Um, Another character, female boxer, right? Mm -hmm. That is the point of the story. Excuse me, not Slumdog Millionaire. Um, million Dollar Baby, million, right? Yeah. Million Dollar Baby. Sorry, that was a brain freeze for me. Um, and you know, that's an in interesting film. I, you know, what's funny? You mentioned boxing. I think it's fascinating. We have so many boxing films, yeah. And yet, how boxing as a sport <laughs> is like not very popular. Yeah, right? yeah. My, I remember when my dad was like, sh was like showing me like all the Rocky films. He was just, he like, he, he was like, he was like, man, if only boxing was actually like this. I think I would actually watch boxing. Right, right. Yeah, I'm with you on that too. And you know, 
something I want to add to like Rocky, just because you know, since we're already on it, um, I love how like the Rocky movies, it started off as like a serious drama, and then kind of by like the third one, it became very goofy and very 80s feel, which is why I, I like the third and fourth one, just because of like they're kind of fun to like laugh at. Yeah, and that goes back to the money making, right? The cash cow. You, yeah, it's rare that a sequel is really gonna advance story and has like genuine like. So I would wager Godfather two, right? You know, um, I already mentioned it earlier. Aliens, mm -hmm. um, I is a different film than the original Alien. Alien is amazing, yeah. but I like Aliens more. It's more action horror, whereas Alien is more psychological horror. Um, how many other sequels can you name, right, that like are better than, or at least in step with the first one? Yeah, I can really only think of, there's Term Terminator 2, mm -hmm. that one. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I loved Quiet Place Part Part 2. Right. I thought it was a very well done sequel, because like in the first one, you know, you weren't really meant to like see the, like, the creatures that much. And then, you know, in the second one, they gave us exactly what we wanted. We wanted to see more of the creatures and more of like, like you know like what the other humans are doing during in this in this war yeah it's interesting you mentioned quiet place too because it, it in in history of film i think right this will be maybe something you'll even study um when you go off to college and you'll actually this become part of the class like the impact of covid mm -hmm. and the, the pandemic specifically on the entire film industry um where quiet place is a great example of that they yeah. put together a really cohesive well done film amidst all of these like restrictions yeah and and so i think like when we go back and we have some time to look at some of the the experiences of what you know it, it's in relation to the film industry um what was produced how it was produced how it changed how we watched movies uh, our ability to focus all that kind of stuff um quiet place will be one of those examples of like this is a, an example of a success yeah um all right so i want to give one more director um, this question's going on longer than I thought, but I, I, I like that though, I like this conversation. Mm -hmm. So one more, of my, one of my favorite directors has probably James Gunn. My, and so my reasoning is that he's able to take, um, you know, these superhero characters, like again, the superhero characters were not that, they're not good guys. Um, Cause like the Guardians of the Galaxy, like the first movie, they, they're all like not, you know, people that, you, that you're supposed to like. Um, but yeah, he's able to, like, to, to take all these characters and bring them together perfectly, um, and just and it's also he's able like he's like able to incorporate comedy in like a good way. Um, one of my problems with some of the Marvel films is that I feel like some of them try like some of the movies like they try too hard to add comedy into them, um, and sometimes it doesn't work very well. Um, but you know, with movies like Guardians of the Galaxy, um, it I think the comedy works perfectly because those characters are supposed to like go off of each other. And that's why I love the new Suicide Squad movie that he did, because he was able to fix what he was able to fix what the original wasn't, and was able to make like what we kind of all wanted to see. And that was just these all these villains get together, and he, he added his comedy touch to it. And I think it's a hilarious movie. And you're right. Like it, my going back to your earlier conversation about kind of bonding, my 12 year old and I watched uh, Peacemaker religiously. Mm -hmm. Now it's not the most appropriate show for him. Um, <laughs> our house, you know, ratings don't always kind of fit, but <laughs> because it was tonally appropriate, like as a comedy, because the main character was meant to kind of be parodied a bit. Yeah. Like you weren't, you know, you were supposed to notice he's a misogynist, and you know, my my son even had a comment during one of the shows, like, "Oh my God, we can never say that, right?" In yeah. real life, and so um, that's kind of nice, right? And I think this goes back to you know earlier when we were talking about vision. You know, James Gunn has a vision. He's yeah, very, he does. very similar to like uh, take a Watiti who did Jojo Rabbit. Like humor is ingrained into their storytelling. Whereas like the other point where like the Marvel films, they add in humor because they're like supposed to. Yeah. And it's not part of the vision. It's, supposed to, it's like the studios, you know, they want, they want parents to be able to bring their kids in to watch it. Right. Which is, why, which is also why we don't really get too many like mature um, superhero movies. That's why I loved the new Doctor Strange because it was it really pushed the boundaries of what PG-13 was. Right. I growing up, I was an X-Men fan. You know, my oldest son is named Xavier, partially not fully because of Professor mm -hmm. Charles Xavier, um, but you know, there's obviously a little influence. Um, but Wolverine was my favorite character. Yeah. 
the Logan film was the first time we actually saw yeah, what it was, Wolverine was. Yeah, right? like, I, because like you know, because like like huge Jackman, he was able to play the character as good as he could with like what he was given as like a script. But it just with the Logan, it's like, it's really like what people wanted to see, like like right at, at, at the get go, which they couldn't do at the, at the time. And it's an amazing film. It's yeah. not even just like the idea was that we're just going to make it gory. It had a clear vision. It was beautifully crafted. Yeah, it's beautifully acted. It's able to it's able to in incorporate the more like mature parts and like 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 into it instead of just you know just adding it just just because they can. Right, and the not spoiling anything, but the the casino sequence mm -hmm. is one of the kind of best superhero kind of. I, I just that you, you know which one I'm going to the time kind of yeah. shifts a little bit yeah. and it's like phenomenal phenomenal filming yeah so that's really my Mount Rushmore of film directors um so it's going kind of going on a, on a negative note so I already know the answer but I think it's funny every time you rant about this so who do you think is the most overrated or just bad director of all time yeah I know I know I talk about um the Bayham right yeah, Michael um, Bay. it, it's one of those interesting things that like if we think about qualifying the question, I'm gonna mm -hmm. get like teachery here for a second. He, Michael Bay makes money. And so if the intent is we wanna make money, right? And studios love making money, yeah. right? Then he's successful. That's yeah. the reason why he keeps to making more films. That's right? why there's so many bad Transformers movies. Right, and, I, and so, so Transformers was like, a def Optimus Prime is a defense moment of my childhood yeah. like you know I, like it's weird to say like but you know think about stories as shifting and shaping morals and all that kind of stuff and the sense of righteous I'm team Autobot all the way Autobots <laughs> I even say when I'm teaching roll out right like we need to go to the library it's like all right the block two, roll out and so um, it wasn't even that he put flames on the truck which Optimus Prime did not have by the way that like kind of bothered me you know he made these movies and you couldn't see the robots yeah and then it just became a cash cow, and they just kept making more and more of them and the stories. On the flip, though, he was a pretty good producer. Uh, the Bumblebee film that came out a few years ago. I've heard that's a pretty um, good, good one. Oh, it's solid. It is everything that a Transformers film should have been. Great soundtrack. It knew what it was, you know, great character development. Um, you know, and so I know it's popular to, to kind of like, um, you know, talk. I'm going to give you a controversial pick. All right. Right, and this is not going to sit well with you because of what just came out of your Mount Rushmore, you know, discussion. But I kind of feel like Martin Scorsese is a little overrated a little? these days. Yeah, not bad. No, I I, I do understand the like Irishman what you're in particular. Yeah, it's like yeah. Well, can can you? Like yeah, on so that. like we look at his classic films, and his classic films, bar none, are some of like the most iconic, you know, things out mm -hmm. there. I think sometimes he puts, you know, Mart Scorsese gets his name attached to something, and then it almost becomes like people are like, oh my God, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, right? Before, yeah. Before, and they don't like look at it through a critical lens. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't finish The Irishman. I thought it was one of the most boring things in the world. Yeah, I've been a little hesitant on watching Irishman, just mostly just because of the the runtime. Right. If I'm yeah, gonna be and, honest. Right, and I think that's one of my criticisms of him is is. I, He's a genius, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he knows what he's doing. He understands his vision, all that kind of stuff. But man, can you make a, can you make a shorter <laughs> film, right? Like, um, do you like um, the Departed? I do, and I don't. <laughs> it's one of those movies that, like, I judge a good film by my personal want mm -hmm. to want to watch it a second time. And so there are certain scenes in the Departed that I think are like super effective. Yeah. Um, I think Jack Nicholson gives a great performance in it. He does, and without spoiling anything, I think the elevator sequence is a great yes, moment in film. Yes, I agree. Um, but as a whole film, right, I kind of like sometimes compare it where you kind of get like this awesome plate of food, and there are some things you don't like, so you kind of pick out the things that you do like, and you and so uh, it's it's not something I've rewatched, and that's kind of my litmus test mm -hmm. is you know is this a film that I'm going to rewatch, or even more specifically, is it a film that I would teach? Um, and I guess kind of like going back to my earlier point, for me, he's so entrenched in that kind of mafia storytelling yeah. that, that I do appreciate when he pushes out. Um, but it's almost like you're kind of going to that same tree over and over and over again. And so that's kind of where he takes a little bit of a knock for me. But 
I'm just an English teacher sitting yeah. in Plymouth meeting, right? There are no. plenty of people who beat me over the head. I can no, I can respect your points because you know he, like like you know I I I I didn't mention him first for a reason because he's recently becoming like a favorite of mine, um, but I haven't really seen like his full filmography. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't I did not feel Taxi Driver that much. I, I like elements of it, like you said about The Departed, but other than that, it's not a movie I really want to ever, I really am going to like go back and actively watch again. Um, but it's, from what I heard, it's, was it like one of the first like anti-hero films? Yeah, and, and that's, that's again, going back to our earlier point about like if you're going to be a serious film person, you kind of have like. Yeah, it's, I, I knew that I kind of had to watch it. Especially if you watch that and then you go watch, um, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of taxi driver in Joker, both both even like stylistically, and then also as the characters. Um, there's another another film at the end that they homage to. Also, of course, has Robert De Niro in it as well. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I'm with you. A taxi Driver is a film I saw once. It's not something I would watch again, yeah. partially because it's disturbing. Yeah. It just, just a little bit. Right, right, right. Um, so I, I want to go back to Michael Bay. So recently, because um, me and my dad, we were uh, prepping up. Well, he, he wasn't, but I, but I kind of wanted to prep up to watch the movie um, Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, which I loved. If you haven't seen, you should watch. It's a very funny and good com comedy to watch. Um, so I watched um, Nick, the old Nicolas Cage movies. Um, so what did you think of The Rock, since you're not a big Michael Bay fan? Because I... I, I I like The Rock. I think it's a good action film. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I well, number one, it's one of the actors of all time of my youth is Sean Connery. Yeah. Right. I mean, Sean Connery to me, he was, <laughs> he was a Frenchman and made no like bombs of like trying to even pretend to do an accent in The Highlander, which is a great cheesy '80s film about people who are immortal and they fight with swords. Uh, he is a Russian ship captain in, in Hunt for an October. Again, his Russian accent is awful, but yeah. yet it's still Sean Connery. And so, he's the first James Bond. Right, and he's the first James Bond. And so, um, yeah, I like The Rock. I think The Rock is entertaining. It was an earlier film for Bay. And was that was that his first or was it Bad Boys? I think time-wise, I think Bad Boys might have been first. I'm not exactly sure. And of course, Nicolas Cage wasn't like a kind of a parody of himself yet, right? <laughs> like he was kind of... Um, I, I can't remember where Raising Arizona falls into his timeline, but Raising Arizona is a masterpiece if you've never seen it before, of Nicolas Cage. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think it's genuinely entertaining. It's a solid film that's not too crazy. But when you go back and you rewatch it, you can kind of see the, the Bayhams yeah. developing, right? Um, so out of the th so like there was three '90s Nicolas Cage movies I watched. It was The Rock, Con Air, and Face Off. And my favorite was probably Face Off, mm. just because. Um, so I like the Fast and Furious movies. I don't know if you don't if, if you like them, but I like them just because it's it's one of those movies that I'm I'm, I'm not watching them to like be critical of. I'm watching it just because it's super ridiculous. And right. Face Off just gave me very Fast and Furious vibes because it's the the most ridiculous plot you could ever think of. Just a, a sociopath and then, a, and then a, a, f a federal agent switching faces. It's like, <laughs> I think that's the most ridiculous thing, but it, um, the director, uh, John Wu, I believe that's the name, he, 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 made it, he made it work and it's entertaining. And like, I was just on my seat, like, cause like, cause, cause when, once some of uh, the, so uh, Nick, Nick Cage's character wakes up and realizes his face had been taken off. So then he takes John Travolta's face and it's like, and then he, and he um, uh, he um, uh, kills everyone that like knew about the operation. So it's just like I'm just like man, like how is um uh, John Travolta's character, who's now has Nick Cage's face, going to get out of this? Because now everyone thinks that he's um the the terrorist sociopath. No, I I I love the way that you kind of framed that answer because I think like I, I'm not actually anti Fast and Furious mm -hmm. because I I you, when you it's kind of like when you know. You, you like all right, I'm gonna eat a Domino's pizza, <laughs> like you know what a Domino's pizza is, yeah. right? And so like your you, your expectations is gonna be it's a Domino's pizza. So when you sit down to like a Fast and a Furious, right? You're expecting something. I think sometimes you know we kind of get tricked where we're thinking that a film is gonna be one thing. Like you're thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be like pizza from Naples, and yeah. then suddenly it's Domino's, um, and then you're like kind of mad at that. Whereas the reverse, it's awesome, where you go into a film and you're thinking it's gonna be not good, and then it turns out to be amazing. I think the first time I ever became kind of a critical 
observer of film was actually Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, the advertising campaign was phenomenal. I'm a huge World War II history person, specifically aerial combat. Uh, one of my favorite planes of all time is the Corsair, which was the Navy uses the Pacific Front. I could not wait to see that film. <laughs> Saw it at midnight on opening night, and, and oh man, what a train wreck <laughs> that movie is. I have not seen it. Ah, uh, believe me, you're not missing anything. <laughs> and it's, it, the story is ridiculous, and the filming, now I will say, to give Michael Bay some credit, because um, he's not, there are parts of his kind of like, you know, tool belt that he can do well. Mm -hmm. um, the actual bombing sequence in Pearl Harbor as a sequence of film is pretty solid. It's not, it's, he's able to do some things visually on a, on a like I'll give you a great for instance with forced perspective where he, he knows how to work a camera which is why I, I kind of get, get a little angry at him because I know he can do yeah. more. Um, he just sometimes takes the easy answer but there's a great moment in Pearl Harbor where the Navy, uh, U.S. Navy officers and, sea and sailors are coming out of the, like this mess hall and they're looking up to like see they're processing this 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 surprise attack mm -hmm. and because of the force perspective you only really see a few planes in the air yeah but the characters are looking off screen and it's the illusion that there are so many more and because of the way they're acting that's a master right he found a way to make it seem like there were thousands of planes in the air and really only three yeah um so i don't i don't hate i don't hate michael bay um i i honestly i find I find his movies entertaining just because I know I'm going to go in. It's, it's not going to be the greatest movie in the world, but I know I'm, I'm going to be entertained. Like, um, Arm, like Armageddon, I, I think it's a very entertaining and um, disaster movie to watch. Right. Um, and then there's another um, meteorite movie. At the exact same yeah, time, yeah. and I'm on the opposite end. I like the, it's called Deep Impact. Yep, I, I, I watched that like a year later with my dad. Yeah, I remember those movies. Talking about how weird is it that two meteor movies come out within like a matter of months of each other? Yeah. Might have even been weeks. Um, I'm on the flip because as a as an English teacher, especially Deep Impact was more focused in on the, the, the people yeah. and the stories. And while the meteor is important, um, it's it's not the focus. And for, it is a little more like a. Re I mean, it's still a little like not very realistic, but it's a little more realistic than Armageddon right. ever was. Well, that's because like Michael Bay too is so infatuated with making things blow up, yeah. right? <laughs> and so like oftentimes he, he goes for the explosion rather than the story development. And, and you know, there's something to be said for that, right? Like if you, but it was an interesting moment in kind of like film history where you had these two films that were telling similar stories that you could literally watch in real time before like, you know, instant on demand stuff to, to kind of really do a yeah. comparison. Yeah, I agree. All right, so who would you consider like the greatest actor or actress of all time? So I'm gonna give you a couple of names. And um, again, going back to my earlier comment about directors, when I look for, I've done some acting, stage acting mostly, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I have a theater background. And so I really appreciate actors that have range that range. like they can they can move beyond kind of you know Leonardo DiCaprio I know is considered to be a great actor and, and I'm gonna throw some shade at him a little bit <laughs> when he's doing a role I know it's Leonardo DiCaprio right it's it's just very rare that when I'm watching him perform that I'm not aware that he's Leonardo DiCaprio yeah and and so for me that's kind of like a knock so to speak but man, Tom Hanks, Tom right? Tom Hanks, I, I agree. He's you know, like everything from Forrest Gump to Saving Private Ryan to going way back, he had a comedy called Bosom Buddies, <laughs> right? I mean, he's got all of these roles. And, you know, now I think he's kind of settled in a little bit. Um, there's a, one of my most favorite films is this movie called Road to Perdition where he plays kind of a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, he's an Irish gangster, and it was a role that like people kind of panned him for that they didn't think he really did well. I actually thought he did phenomenally well in, um, just because it was a different take. Um, sometimes actors will, will kind of know what their niche is, and they won't move beyond it, and you know they won't take risks, mm -hmm. and so they kind of get typecasted. I always look for people who are willing to take those risks, and, if yeah. they, and even if they don't do well in them, I kind of like, I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's awesome. So I love, um, 
I, I love Samuel L. Jackson mm -hmm. just because I know like it's kind of going because like you know it's kind of like with Leonardo DiCaprio like you know it's Samuel L. Jackson, mm -hmm. but I don't know it's just like anytime like I see him like in a film I know I'm gonna love his character just because I think he's hilarious he's my favorite character in, in Pulp Fiction, um, Jules don't remember the last name, um, but. Just and you know I, I, I love Jules um, I love I love Jules's like development um, like in like the film I'm not gonna spoil anything but I just think it's like a pretty good like character development for like a, um, for like a character that for like because like, like you see him in like the beginning and you can already know that like him and John Travolta they're, they're not they're not good they're not good good people and then you can kind of just see him just like develop um, even though he's he's only in the, he's only in like two he's only in, he's only in two uh, seg segments of, of the entire film right. So, yeah. And he's so convincing in that movie, so convincing, and not spoiling it for anyone. If you haven't seen it and you're listening to this, you have to watch Pulp Fiction at some point. Um, think about how violent that film is, yeah. right? And some of the things that occur in that film. Most people don't realize there's um, a Christian coalition that awards also to films. That movie won like the Christian film of the year I don't because of Samuel Jackson's character. <laughs> And like that's how that, that's crazy. It is crazy, right? Like you think about everything but his redemptive arc, specifically the diner scene at the end, mm -hmm. where it shows, like you said, on when he, you know, it's a Samuel Jackson uh, kind of like production, but it's entertaining. But mm -hmm. in that film, not only is it entertaining, that scene in the diner is so real, yeah. right? At the end, where they're talking, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but they're having this conversation where he's being challenged by John Travolta and I'm in like I was in like yeah. and, and when the thing happens and he's interacting with the guy that it, when it happens yeah. like there was not a moment that I didn't did not believe right I was into that moment yeah and he's you know like he's like pretty much like the most like recognizable character in that entire movie and like I said before he's he, when you really think about it, he's not in the movie like all like all that much like John Travolta's character is, is pretty much in the entire movie right 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 another actor I'll throw up there he's a classic um, is Paul Newman <laughs> like a lot of people know him like you go to the grocery store and you see he's selling pizza and like you know salad <laughs> dressing and all that kind of stuff I'll come back to that in a second but he has some of the most iconic movie roles of all time uh, one of which if you've never seen as kind of going back into like you know, the lexicon of films you have to kind of watch. It's Cool Hand Luke, mm -hmm. um, uh, Sundance Kid. Um, oh my God, Sundance Kid. Uh, da, blah, 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 blah. I can't remember the full title, but that's another film. And then he's actually in Road to Perdition. Um, he's in this, this amazing actor that just kind of ranges in a whole bunch of different different directions. Yeah. Well, Butch well. Cassidy in the Sundance Kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go to the next question. Um, so this is kind of like, what I think is like the most important question in this entire episode. So what really makes a good movie a good, a good movie? Yeah, it, it, it's one of these things I think like, I have a buddy who works for a corporation. He's really high up. And we got into a conversation one day um, about people. And mm -hmm. he's high up in the point that he like manages people. Like he's the higher fire, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he had this like discussion where he was like, oh, people, people make decisions rationally, right? yeah. that they're very scientific about them. And I was actually kind of like, no, that's not really true. And I find that, that a lot of times, emotion, right? And so I think everyone has like a favorite movie, yeah. right? And I think maybe it's a favorite television show or a favorite series or a favorite movie. And oftentimes that favorite movie is associated with a memory. Yeah, yeah. And then that memory is typically shared, right? Like I remember when I saw this movie with my dad or my girlfriend or wow, there was this line in this film or this moment. And you know, I think that's what makes good movies good. Yeah, I you back to like what I was saying, you know, like Star Wars, I'll always, you know, I will always love Star Wars and I'll always associate it with my dad sharing Star Wars with me. Um, the Harry Potter movies, you know, that's, you know, because, you know, so like Star Wars was my dad. Harry Potter was for my mom. So like I always remember like watching all the Harry Potter movies with my mom. Um, so yeah, I think emotional connections can really make a movie like good and like allow people to like share me memory like with other people. Yeah, it's one of the things that people like don't realize is is that 
humans are storytellers, yeah. right? I mean, our lives are actual stories. And, you know, the written language is a little bit AP lit light at you guys. Um, the written language went out of favor for a really long time. And the Greeks developed the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, to record two stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. like, people don't realize that writing came about for these stories that were completely made up and yet helped to like teach Greek boys how to be like men, to, mm -hmm. to talk about the gods, to establish rules and mores. And so, you know, the, this idea of like being able to tell a story in a defined moment that people can somehow connect to. Um, I do this survey every year where we watch Saving Private Ryan about which character kind of stands out the most to people. And every year, it's almost universally, and I'm not spoiling it for anyone, it's almost always the same character. I don't, want to, I don't know if we should say it on, on <laughs> here or not, because maybe it's a little bit of a plot spoiler. You can ask me after yeah. the, the mics are done. <laughs> but I think that's telling, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's telling that like, you know, when we watch a rival in the class, that, that collectively, students realize the genius of the film. Yeah almost at the exact same moment. And then in their brain, they're like, wow. Yeah. Um, all right, so there's only two more questions. Yep. Um, so this is a question for the last one. What movie would you consider a perfect movie? Now, uh, there is a difference for me between a perfect movie and my all-time favorite, because what I might consider a perfect might not be my all-time favorite. Yeah, this is, this is one of those questions that um, I have a hard time answering because I have such a deep connection to a lot of films, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go with Jaws. I Jaws. think Jaws is an absolute film, um, largely for everything we've already talked about. Um, to me, one of the most iconic moments in all of film history is the moment that occurs in the boat where it's three guys, and they're kind of comparing wounds. And, and Robert Shaw, who is also on my Mount Rushmore of great actors, he plays Clint tells the true story of the USS Indianapolis mm -hmm. and you're in right like you're you feel the fear that they fear you feel the kind of hero's journey this, this camera work is amazing that movie is made in 70 something mm -hmm. and other than really one cheesy shot where the shark looks completely fake uh, <laughs> today uh, man that I can watch that film over and over again yeah um so for me i know this is kind of a stereotypical answer but i don't really care i'm gonna go with shawshank redemption right. it's just it's the most to me it's the most satisfying ending to any movie like i there's no way you could ever follow that up with a sequel it ends right it, it ends perfectly um i find it i think it's amazing that the film flopped in the box office mm -hmm. um but and you know, like you can ask like, so many people, and they will tell you that like Shawshank Redemption is either their favorite or one of their favorite movies of all time. You know, follow, you know, just like I'm so invested in following and um, um, Andy Dufresne in Red. Like, just I don't know. It's just I love I I love watching the film. I've watched it three times, and I still love it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? Because like. Let me ask you, was that the first time you watched it in my film class? Yes, it was my first time watching it. Right, so how, by the way, film appreciation, right? For yeah. those of you that are PW students. Um, I think it just speaks to the universality of that, what we're already talking about, right? You might have people who watch Jaws and don't connect to it because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they don't connect to any of the three characters. Never, when you watch Shawshank, it's almost impossible to not connect yeah. to Red and Andy. Never mind, it has this beautiful message about hope and to boot, it doesn't, it doesn't shy away from talking about some really dark subject matter. I mean, yeah. one of the most iconic lines in the film deals with that. Like, I wish I could tell you this character put up the good fight and things went good for him, but they don't, yeah. right? And so I think that's part of what makes that movie so inspiring. There are people who go on field trips to go find, like, the sites for that, right? My dad went to the prison that it was shot in. Right. Um, yeah. Um, it's also instrument, instrument, inst whatever. I'm not gonna say that word. Um, Steve, it was um, Steve. So it's a Stephen King, um, like adaptation, of, which I think is amazing. Yeah. And you know, like two of my favorite Stephen like King like adaptations are his non horror movies, and that's Stand Stand by Me and um, Shawshank. And I think, I don't know. It's 
I think that shows like Stephen um, Stephen King has like a pretty wide range. He's not just a horror guy. I so one of my I'll I'll lay it out there. My wife loves Stephen King. She has she's an English teacher as well. She mm-hmm. has read every Stephen King possible. Um, I do not like his horror. <laughs> However, like you just said, I think his non horror stories, especially that book. So that's the story Shawshank is based on. is called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. There's another film called The Green Mile, which is also one of his I've, stories. I've been hesitant to watch it because I know so many people have told me it's such an emotional movie to watch. It's hard to watch. Yeah. It's really, it's not quite the quality, overall and, quality of And Shawshank. it's a Tom Hanks too, right? It is a Tom Hanks. And, and so I think Stephen uh, King is a really great observer of people. By the way, this summer I went up to Bangor, Maine, which mm-hmm. is near um, Acadia, which is where he, a lot of his stories are set. And it's crazy. If you're a Stephen King fan, you have to find your way north <laughs> because they're all of the, the, the water tower from it is there, um, the giant lumberjack, like all of these things that are in his stories are all there. Um, so I'm just going to bring point this out like right now because it's very controversial. I don't like The Shining movie. And the <laughs> only reason I don't like it is because I read the book first. Yeah. And I personally, I just think the book like deals with the character of Jack so much better than the movie did because you know in the book he's just a he's just a struggling guy who's had bad things happen to him and you know he's trying to you know make good but in the movie he's just a bad guy like right at the start so it yeah i i just i i under, i i appreciate it i under, right. i can see like like why people love it so much it's just not the movie for me it's it's an interesting uh I think the way you just frame that is perfect, right? I too appreciate it. I don't love it. Um, I think there are some really iconic, the 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 young boy riding on his tricycle yeah. through the hallways and the, the scary twins is really super mesmerizing as as an actual. I think it's got one of the best movie trailers. If you look up like top movie trailers of all time, the trailer for it is pretty phenomenal. Over the summer, we tried to watch it while we were at the beach with, um, you know, some teenagers that like we were in a shared house, and they had no interest in it. Yeah. Like they just didn't. It did nothing for them, which I thought was interesting, because I was in my first. I was like, oh, they're just teenagers, and then as I was watching it, I was like, no, they're right. This is kind of boring. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know, but just when I watched it, I was. I think it was because I was expecting a lot more from what I read in the book because I find the book actually a little terrifying to read. I, not, not very many books can do that to me. Um, and I, th- I think it ends, I'm not going to spoil it, but I think it ends a lot better than the movie did because I don't know how to say it without spoiling. All right, spoiler alert for those listening. <laughs> skip, you know, like two, two minutes. Um, so, in, so in the book, Jack, he, so like the Jack character, he dies like a hero because, you know, he... He kind of like he's he's about to like ax um Danny I believe his name is and then you know Danny he's like he's asking his dad to like stop his this insanity and then and then you know um sorry for like the it's kind of gross but you know like that's when like Jack kind of like reverts back to you know like the good guy that he is and you know he ends up sacrificing himself when with the ax so that he can stop this madness and the then the hotel like explodes but then in the movie however he. He, he dies exactly how he started. He had kind of had like no like development as a character. He was, ar- he was already like a not very good guy to begin with. And then he just freezes in the end. And I, I, just, I, just, I just didn't really like that. I, th- I, just, I thought, I thought you know, maybe he would sacrifice himself like he did in the book. But no, he just chases Danny around the maze. And then his, him and the mom escape. And he just freezes to death. And, and I, I think you're pointing to one of the flaws of the movie, which is that you know, which we've been talking a lot about, about good movies, is that there's nothing to connect to with yeah. him, right? I mean, yeah. he's already a bad guy, and you're kind of watching his descent, and, you know, either you're into it or you're not. Like, I, I actually pair it against the, the new Joker film, mm-hmm. right? With the new Joker film, we kind of get what, what's going on with Joaquin Phoenix, yeah. right? I mean, he's, his medicine's being taken away, social services are being cut, you know, life just keeps piling on and on and yeah, on and that's, on. That's what my sister liked, because she felt bad for, for right. him. You don't feel bad for Jack Nicholson yeah, in the I, film. You know, because Jack Nicholson, he, he, he plays it very well. I love that I, very iconic, here, here comes Johnny, you know, like, he, he plays very good, like, insane character, but I feel like if, 
could have if if Kubrick could have just written it better. I'm not the biggest Stanley Kubrick fan. I I've I've, I've been meaning to get around to watching um Full Full Metal Jacket, but from but like I've really only seen The Shining and I a little bit of 2001 Space Odyssey, and he's not he's not really been my favorite director. And I don't even I don't really know if I want to watch Clockwork Orange just because it's for those who don't know I've heard it's very very controversial. It, he de he deals with like. In almost in a very obsessive manner, yeah. very disturbing things, and he's he's willing to show or allude to to the point where your brain fills in the gaps. Um, Clockwork Orange is not an easy film to watch yeah. uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, Full Metal Jacket's interesting because it's almost like two different movies. The first half of the film deals with boot camp, and then the second half actually deals with them in country in Vietnam and. Um, I actually think the first half of the film is quite masterful. The second half of the film is good, but doesn't quite live up to the first half. Um, I'm with you. You know, Stanley Kubrick. It's almost kind of you know sacrosanct to like you know say bad things about yeah. him. But um, you know, it, it, for his time in particular. Yeah, for his time. I don't because like my one friend, he kind of brought up a good point. that 2001: Space Odyssey. I don't. Really know if we should it could really like these days be considered a great of all time because there's just some things about it that just haven't really aged the best and it's it's not really a movie that like somebody these days is gonna want to watch right because they've already seen stuff like it before I'll 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 go on the other end of that like I think the the caveman sequence in the first part is very dated yeah and really the set pieces there's nothing about that. However, if you watch the, um, the space sequence, which is like the, the middle part um, story, Interstellar has some beautiful homages back to Space Odyssey 2001, and particularly with a docking sequence of how, and when you start to look at like the practical effects that Kubrick was using, um, sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, this is kind of dated. And other times you're like, wow, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you see so many other kind of callbacks and like Christopher Nolan does a lot of callbacking to Space Odyssey, um, particularly of Interstellar, um, which by the way, he's another great filmmaker right? yeah. that like knows his visions. Not always like great stories, but at least he's pretty much a master. Yeah, um, yeah I've, I will eventually, um, get to watching like all of 2001 Space Odyssey and watching Full Metal Jacket, but for now, Kubrick is just is I just don't really like see like I don't find him like you know I, he's probably what I would consider for me at the moment is overrated. Sure. Um, I know that m a lot of people might not like that, but it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's like you you might even be throwing an okay boomer, right? You yeah. Know? <laughs> like there's <laughs> there's like time and place kind of rule, and sometimes things are amazing in their time and place, and then you know time passes, and we start to look back on them and go, okay, yeah, you know this was good for then, but not so much now. Yeah. Well, I just had to get that off my chest, but <laughs> let's just go to the last question, and what is your all-time favorite movie? Yeah, okay. Um, it's a hard one. Yeah. It is, it is. Do you have one lined up? Do you? I do have one All right, one why don't you up. go first, and then? So, for me, honestly, like, I think, I, I didn't know it at first, but I kind of have realized it. Um, it's been Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. I just... It's one of those movies that I can literally watch like every day, and I don't think I, I, I would get tired of it. No, I probably would eventually, but for now, I, I, c I could watch it multiple times. And what I like about it is just, is just I just like the, the set pieces. I like the time period that it takes place in. Um, Harrison Ford is a great character as Indiana Jones. It's, I, I, I love watching like Indiana Jones, and you know, you, it's just like, Cause it, you 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 would know like what like what is he's trying to get? It's the MacGuffin of the movie, which is the Lost Ark. Right. Um, I think the movie still looks great. Um, when the first time my dad told me um, that like when um, Indiana Jones is like climbing like under the the truck in the in the chase scene, um, he told me that that was that that was all real, and I was like, wait, what? He's like, <laughs> um, which the stunt show in um, Disney World makes a lot more sense, like why that like why they have that, but. Yeah, I, I, I love watching Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, it's my favorite Indiana Jones movie. And, of course, I like the other ones, except for the last one. Uh, um, 
And um, I'm, ex I'm hoping that they're going to fix all the problems with uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull for the new one that's coming out right. next year. But yeah, it's, I'd have to say Ra um, Ra Raiders of the Lost Ark. Even though I, can, I see flaws in it, but I don't care about those flaws. Uh, right, right, right. And I, so I grew up with those films. Yeah. Right? They are, they're a part of my childhood. I remember really liking the movie of the trilogy, or I guess it's more than a trilogy now, but uh, The Last Crusade to me of that. That's movie. what a lot of people say. Uh, Sean, again, Sean Connery. Um, it's got one of the most iconic moments or lines he chose poorly. Right. I actually <laughs> say that in class sometimes to see if any students are like cool and know what I'm talking about. Um, it's actually a little bit, it makes me sad that film too, because a lot of King Arthurian legend is lost. Mm -hmm. You know, like they don't really teach that anymore. And so when people try to sit down and watch that movie now, like with my own kids, they just went right over their head. Yeah. They had no idea what was going on. Um, I'm gonna go with the movie that I started with. You know, I have kind of favorite films, like uh, for instance, Nightmare Before Christmas is one of my more favorite films of all time. Um, I love Tim Burton, but I think I think the movie really that has defined a lot of like the way my brain works um, is, is, is aliens. Which is what we started on. Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, and, and this is because, you know, I was a, a kid who, you know, kind of grew up in, in a household where I didn't have like, you know, great uh, connections with my parents and all that kind of stuff. And one of the defining moments of that movie, um, okay, everyone, a little bit of a plot spoiler here, but you know, you can jump ahead if you want. There, I, I can kind of frame it in a way it's not. There's a character that goes missing, mm -hmm. and there's an adoptive kind of relationship that exists with Sigourney Weaver, and she goes to save this yeah. kid, right? I mean, that doesn't, that's not hers. Yeah, she has the chance to like, to, like, to, like, get out of that planet. Right, and she can leave and move on, and more than likely, you know, the kid, you know, right? And so, um, Growing up, I remember having this conversation with my cousin, of all people, yeah. like he was older than me, trying to figure out, like, I'm like, well, why wouldn't she leave? Like, why wouldn't she just do, right, take care of herself? And he, he made this comment about, like, well, why wouldn't you go save a kid? And, yeah. and that kind of, I was in third grade. I'm a 44-year-old dude. And <laughs> I can tell you it was hot. We were on the second floor of our house in ugly orange shag carpeting because there was a leftover from the 70s, watching it on this small, junky TV. And, and, you know, my dog is named Ripley, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like I, when I was thinking about like a dog, I'm like, I want a dog that's gonna fight off aliens to save my kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna stick with aliens. So just one more question. So you watched aliens first before you watched alien. Years apart. I yeah. didn't even know, like, I mean, cause uh, I think at the time you had to be 16 to rent a car, like rent a movie. Mm -hmm. And so, I, for some reason, I was able, I think we maybe even bought Aliens on VHS or I taped it illegally, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or something like that. And, and I don't think I saw Alien until maybe college. Wow. So that's a huge, now, like, one of the best parts about now is like, you want a movie, you just like go on Amazon, your yeah. phone, boom, and there it is, you know, back in the day. You can just like a, search up like how many movies are in that film series. Right, right, right. And now like it's, there's some great memes because the 80s, right? Stranger Things is bringing back some 80s nostalgia. Like nothing was more disappointing than going to Blockbuster and like <laughs> looking for a movie and then you finally settle in one and you pull it back and there's nothing there, right? <laughs> it was just like the empty film and you had to settle for, you know, whatever. Um, or you also like didn't know like if the movie was even good. Right. So that could like ruin your entire weekend that's you right have any other movie to watch and then god help you if you didn't rewind it when you brought it back because then <laughs> you got charged two dollars and fifty cents <laughs> yeah well thank you for being on this episode um this was a great talk um and yeah so you know this might be my last episode i don't know yet maybe i'll continue on my own channel but for now um, this is going to be my last one so thank you guys for listening, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Yeah, thank you for having me.